episode 26 of Security Matters with the Coffee Squad. For those of you joining us or just uh, forgot, we usually start out our uh, Coffee Squad with uh, talking about our drinks. Then we have questions of the week, articles of the week, and then a topic of the week. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, security basics. Got a uh, some response from a couple of our listeners asking some differences between threats and vulnerabilities, stuff like that. So we're just going to kind of talk over the basics and some of uh, what these words mean, stuff like that, for those of you who may not know or just to clarify or or just to kind of, you know, remind you. How are you doing this morning, Jake? I'm doing good, buddy. How are you? I'm doing great. You know, chipped my tooth on a... Are you really? <laughs> chipped my tooth on a fruit smoothie, so I'm doing awesome. Man, I think you need some fluoride treatment or something. I <laughs> yeah, know. I need something. Too you much need, coffee. You need, you need some teeth strengthening exercises, man. Like <laughs> Probably from grinding that, my man. teeth or something. As, as I'm sitting here joking with you, uh, I'm I'm sorry to hear that. That actually absolutely sucks. So, uh, is it? Have you gone to the dentist yet, or what, what's going on here? I have an appointment in about an hour and a half. So yeah. Ah, uh-huh. so yeah, is it still like super sensitive? sensitive? It's not. You know, it's not even sensitive. It's just annoying because it's you know I can feel it. So. Mm-hmm. So your tongue's sitting there playing with it. And yep. It. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Good times. Good <laughs> times. What else is 2020 going to bring you this year? You know. Um, I, I mean, I was thinking about it the other day. Smoothie. How long ago was Hurricane Isaias or whatever it is? It feels like it was like months ago. It was three weeks it was ago. Just like two, three weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. It feels like it was so much, lo- so long ago. And it was just a couple weeks ago. So, yeah. 2020 uh, is like the year of STDs, man. It just keeps giving and there's nothing you can mm-hmm. do about it, man. Except for just try to avoid it as much as possible. Yeah. So, Keep uh, locked away. Hope it goes yeah, away. It's, uh, yeah. It just, yeah. Just when you think things are getting bad, you know, uh, something else seems to pop up. So now I read this morning that the farm, Farmer's Almanac is predicting a pretty uh, harsh winter. So, you know, that'll be fun. Not that we're going to get affected by it. But. I mean, so I love the Farmer's Almanac. I haven't read, you know, the new one for, for 20, for winter 2021. So um, we both live in North Carolina. Where I live, it seems like every other year we get snow. Um, you might get a light dusting, but. You know, sometimes it could be up to six inches at a, at a time. Um, and it's never like it, it snows and it sticks around for like weeks. It's happened a few times. But um, so la- this year, 2020, it was the year we're supposed to get snow, but read the Farmer's Almanac in 2019. They're like, no snow, just, a, you know, a cold, damp, wet winter. And sure enough, it was a cold, wet, damp winter. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what they read for, or what I read for this area. Yep. Uh, I love snow. So I'm, I'm hoping they say, you know, you're going to get pounded with a snowstorm. Um, so I used to love it. snow. Yeah. I, I imagine you walk in it about the same I do all slip and sliding. So, yeah, you know, so the good thing about having a prosthetic is that when you fall, I just go down and like fall on my prosthetic knee and it doesn't hurt. I don't feel anything. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. It may break the thing, but I don't <laughs> feel it. So, but my back feels it. That's the problem. Yeah. So, uh, maybe that's just me getting old. Who knows? But uh, do a nice yeah. PLF. You'll be all right. Yeah, I do. I do enjoy the snow. So, what are you drinking today, Will? Caught me mid drink. All right. So, I'm drinking a Liberty Blend, or the yeah, the Liberty Brand Blend from Black Rifle Coffee Company. Like I said, I bought that bag a while ago. I'm I'm almost out of it now. Had to wait till next year when they come back out with it. I might end up buying more bags because it's it's probably my favorite blend by them. It's delicious. I really like. It. I'm really enjoying it. Good. What about you? Drinking a little kind of water and a little water, you know. So I got my tea here in this cup, uh, a little Winkler knives cup. Um, I did an assessment for them years ago, and then um, just a regular water cup here. So yeah, just a little little tea and water this morning. Nothing, nothing, too nothing great. too fancy. No, no, no pinkies up, foo foo water three this morning. No, not this morning, man. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, so my kitchen's completely torn out. We had a f- water leak in the fridge, and um, it's been going on for like two weeks now. So it's been a good time. So my whole routine's a little off right now. Man, they're still working on that. Jeez. Oh, they're still ripping stuff out. So uh, <laughs> yeah, some of it's water damage. I think some of it's damaged by them ripping stuff out. I know uh, Friday night, you know, they're pulling out. Uh, I have hardwood floors in my kitchen, and they're pulling out some of the hardwood. And they're new too. We're talking less than three years old. So. Um, they're pulling out some of the hardwood flooring underneath the dishwasher and they disconnected the dishwasher, but they didn't shut the water valve off all the way. And so I got, so now home. you have water damage underneath there. <laughs> yeah. So I got home, there's water just flowing out of the, uh, 
of the sink cabinet there. Um, so that was a fun Friday night waiting for them to show up, you know, get a plumber. I guess they cracked like the valve. So uh, that's why it was, it wasn't like a, a springing leak. It's just a slow drip, mm-hmm. uh, but that adds up after a while. So yeah, good times, man. So 2020. That whole sec- yeah. That whole section <laughs> has to come out too. So uh, I don't know. Uh, it is what it is. Uh, can't change it. Just roll with it. Right. Yep, exactly. So, uh, well, cool. So, I, uh, I I saw your question of the week, and I cha- changed it up. I don't know if you've looked at it or not, yep. uh, but I'm going to kind of put you on the spot here. So, um, so how do you continue to learn in order to stay on top of things within your role? So, your role uh, is our director of training. Um, so, you, you help put you put on the podcast. You do other training. So. How do you continue to learn and grow in that role? What are some things that you do? So, you know, I'm kind of learning as I go a lot of this because I've developed, you know, obviously I've made courses in the past, been teaching for 15 years on the law enforcement level. So my biggest thing is I look at how other companies have done it and I try to emulate, take what I think is good with them and things that I install it and things that I don't necessarily agree with or think worked works very well or will work for us. I just kind of, I just leave that aside. Um, and that's kind of the biggest thing, you know, on, as far as my teaching role now, working with security in order to understand better how you guys do your job and everything like that. I am seeking out more training, especially through FEMA and DHS, stuff like that, taking those courses to kind of understand a little bit more about what we're talking about on these uh, podcasts and stuff like that. Cause by law enforcement does a lot of it similarly there's you know the nomenclature is different a lot of times and the the methodology is different in some cases so it's it's good to kind of see both sides of it so where i can integrate it together gotcha what about you um i similar right so i look at i'm always reading i'm always looking at you know what i can do better review um you know i talk of asis a lot here uh, I think they're a wonderful source for information in the security realm. Um, and then I look at stuff that that I can improve upon that I'm not so strong on. So cybersecurity, um, I know I mentioned this, you know, handful of podcasts ago, but, you know, I finished uh, a cybersecurity course through Harvard. And, and so I look at uh, organizations out there that will help improve my learning um, and some of the areas that I could strengthen. So cybersecurity is one of those areas this year that I really uh, try to focus on uh, and learn more about, um, become more proficient with, because I look at physical and cybersecurity, um, they kind of go hand in hand. You know, you have the physical element, you have the human element, and then you have the technical element. And the technical to me is is that cyber side. So uh, researching courses like that, I think, uh, there's, you know, different websites, there's Coursera, there's edX, there's, um, a ton, a ton of other courses. You have Harvard, yep. Stanford, uh, all MIT the universities. Yeah. They all provide, you know, yep. some type of course. And then it depends on your budget, you know, um, the Harvard course, I want to say was a few thousand dollars, um, comes with a certificate at the end. And I, I gotta be honest, like I learned a ton from there. Um, yep. it wasn't pretty every week having to do that and juggle this job and everything else. Um, you know, with a report every single week, uh, class discussions, that kind of stuff. But I learned a ton. And then the great thing was the connections. Um, I, you know, made a handful of uh, really good connections out there. So um, yeah, those are the things I do. Just read, kind of research, look, like you said, um, look at other companies out there that I consider to be successful. And, you know, what are they doing right? Um, you know, what things can we em- emulate within our own company? And then uh, what are things that we could do better, you know, that we yeah. know? So. I, I know a lot of those places that you mentioned, like Coursera, MIT, and stuff like that, I, they do have the paid courses for their certificate, but they do offer the chance. A lot of the courses, they offer the opportunity. You can take it but you, for free, but you don't get that certificate at the end, and you don't take a test at the end to say, you know, yeah, to yeah. reinforce what you've learned. But you can still have access to the learning of it. So somebody who may be starting out in early career doesn't have the uh, financial stability to, to do that stuff right now. It's still not a bad idea to take those courses and, and build up your, your knowledge base. So, yes. you know, you, you know what you're doing, know what you're talking about. And then later on, you can always go back and take it again and get your certificate or whatever. Yeah. I think the you know, like edX and, and Coursera are two great um, 
organizations out there that provide all sorts, you know, if you want to learn about statistics, they have a, you know, statistics course, you know, uh, how to write better, you know, business writing, all these different courses out there, I, I think are wonderful that they have. So uh, two, two great little organizations that help people continue their education, whether you want to pay for it or not. A lot of them are free and they're from amazing universities all around the globe. Yep. So, all right. Um, you ready for the hard hitting question of the week? Yeah, let's do this. Okay. So my question is New York or Chicago style pizza. Now I know you're from California, but California pizza is not a real thing. All right. So either New York or Chicago style. Hey, let me correct you. California pizza is a real thing. <laughs> you see a lot of California pizza kitchens all over the place. So uh, that goes to show you that it is a real thing. Uh, but let me tell you, my favorite is by far Chicago style pizza. So um, I've been to Chicago oh, a handful of times. Um, I haven't been in like the last 10 years, but I uh, love the city uh, when I went there and visited. Um, great area. So I, on one of my trips, I literally went and visited all the famous and recommended Chicago pizza restaurants. I mean, I literally ate my way through the city. So, you know, start off at your typical um, pizzeria Uno and Dway, and then branch out to like Lou Monaldi's and Giordano's, however you say is uh, that yeah. one. But the, uh, Lou's and Giordano's are, are my two favorites. So, and you can actually, crazy and funny enough, I was actually talking about pizza, I don't know, a week or two ago with my brother-in-law. Um, and we we're talking about Chicago style pizza and he's like, I haven't really had it. You know, mine is like, I'm like, Oh man. So there's a, a website where you can actually order sh real Chicago style pizza frozen to you and then you just bake it in the oven. They give you everything to do it. Hmm. Um, so I do that a few times a year. Uh, so I absolutely love Chicago style. pizza. <laughs> New York is just too wet, man. It's too floppy, too wet. Um, and where I live, there's a bunch of New Yorkers that have all retired down here. So all I get here, is that sloppy, wet, thin <laughs> Chicago style pizza? So, um, yeah, California pizza is really just a ton of toppings. You know, fresh, fresh toppings. That's what I can kind of and a little bit of a thicker crust. Not, not a Chicago style crust. Not a New York style crust. Yeah, it's like a medium. Yeah. yeah. So, what about you, man? Uh, what's your What's your favorite? I I prefer the New York style because I like podcast that. podcast is dumb, man. I can't talk to yeah. you. <laughs> I just like the thinner crust. Now it's got to be crispy. It can't be like a floppy. I like a crispy crust, thin crust. Um, yeah. I've been to New York. I haven't been to Chicago. I've had Chicago style pizza and it's good. It's just, you know, it feels like I'm eating a casserole, like a lasagna or something. Yeah. Just so much. It's yeah, so buddy. It's like, there's nothing like better than a night crust. out and yeah. night, night out at the uh, club, drinking a lot of water and you just want to grab a slice on the way home. You know, I, I just, I just love a good slice of New York style pizza. So right, have you ever had a Patsy speaking of nights out going out? Have you ever had a Patsy? Is that kind of like a, um, like an empanada or something? Yeah. It's like a, it's a British empanada. So okay. uh, in California where I grew up, uh, there's a Patsy place right next to the bars and we'd always get to grab a Patsy uh, when we were done there in downtown See, we, Sacramento. When, when I was in uh, Germany, when we got done, we'd go, to the, we'd go out and grab the uh, Donner kebabs. And that's essentially the Turkish uh, gyro. Man, those things are good. Yeah, my wife tried to make gyros yesterday. It wasn't happening. <laughs> I had to go get Jimmy John's. So, <laughs> thank God she doesn't listen to this podcast right now. <laughs> I'd be 2020 would just get a lot worse. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, all right, let's yeah. go ahead. Let's move into articles. Uh, yeah, let's of the move week. on, man, before I start burying myself <laughs> yeah, here. Yeah, I'll, I'll save you, throw you a lifeline. Thank you. Thank you. So, so articles um, of the week, right? Let, yep, let's yep. Let, let's just knock out the one I know you and I we're all going to talk about. So, it is Thursday morning. I don't even know what the date is. Let me look at my fancy little watcher 27th, yeah, the 27th, right? So, uh, Hurricane Laura literally just made landfall about seven hours ago. Uh, seven, eight hours ago there in Louisiana, Texas. They're right on the border of Lake Charles area of Louisiana. Um, and it hit as a cap four. Uh, yep. I have a bunch of buddies uh, in, in Louisiana, main, mainly in the uh, Baton Rouge area uh, and some buddies there in Texas and then clients also. And so talking with them yesterday, like, Hey, you guys ready? You prepared? Um, you know, and, and they're saying is like, Hey, where's, now as we're going to be, you know, yeah. we're going to let the chip, chips fall where they are. And 
I can tell you not a lot, but a few of my like buddies and, and customers, you know, like, oh, it's going to be a cat two, you know, a, a low cat two. Um, and this thing just intensified and intensified and intensified. Thank goodness. Uh, what was the one before Laura that uh, kind of went up the coast was more of a tropical storm. I just hit a few uh, days Marco. Ago right there. Yeah. It was Marco, Marco, right? Yeah. Um, you know, luckily they didn't converge and make one massive storm, but mm-hmm. the Cat 4 is, is pretty big. So uh, reading in the news um, this morning, uh, you know, like Lake Charles, several skyscrapers when it was blown out. There's people who didn't evacuate. I guess there's about 150 people on the coast who um, didn't evacuate. So they're calling for help, but there's no way to getting help in yeah. right now because the roads are flooded, power lines are down. Uh, and what amazes me, um, look, I'm somewhat of a hardhead. Um, and I shouldn't say I like pain, but I'm such a hardhead that I have to learn through pain. You um, embrace the suck. Yeah. And it's like, okay, hey, it is what it is. And so I guess I understand the people that, that have stayed back. However, this is the same area that I got hit in 2005 with Hurricane Rita and devastated the place. It looks like mm-hmm. they're getting devastated now. Um, and, you know, if I think for our listeners, right, who what I don't care whether it's, you know, hurricane season or tornado season, wherever you live, whatever the I mean, if you live in in Asia, it could be typhoon, you know, like whatever natural disaster you have coming your way. And if they're try and heed your emergency workers um, recommendations, because um, now these people are stuck and who knows, a handful of them may perish and die. Uh, and now you're putting, you know, your your first responders uh, their lives in jeopardy as well. But to me, it's just, um, it's sad, right? Uh, the devastation that's going on. I couldn't imagine living there and watching either my business get torn apart, my home get torn apart, and then the lives. Uh, you know, yeah. I'm sure there's going to be lives that are lost due to this. So, um, And it's not slowing down. I mean, I think it's a Category 2 right now. Uh, it's moving fast. It's up in uh, Alabama or something, right? Yeah, it's going to be a uh, category one. They say by the, no, I think it's still in Louisiana. It'll be in Shreveport by this evening, is okay. what I'm looking at right now. And then it'll move its way into Arkansas, kind of across Tennessee, Kentucky area, and then Virginia. Um, and we might get a little taste here in North Carolina. Um, yeah, I think we're supposed to get it on Monday, right? A little Sunday, bit of rain, Monday, maybe. So. Yeah, Sunday, Monday um, or Saturday. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just, uh, you know, and this is, you know, it's hurricane season. So, you know, we always talk about having a plan and being prepared. So uh, part of that plan should be listening and uh, to your advisors. And again, Hey, if you, if you think you're good, you know, understand the risk that you're taking. Yeah. Um, when you basically say wave off and say, Hey, I'm good that you may be stuck in alone for weeks on end. Well, if there's an evacuation or, you know, I get, it. I want to stay home when my, you know, I, I want yeah, to stay on the coast. I mean, I always want to stay with my house to take care of it for not only from looters, but the one time I did evacuate a few years ago, it was supposed to be a three ended up hitting us at a one, but I had a branch go through my roof. And if I had been here, I probably could have saved a lot of uh, our, our stuff inside the house from uh, the rain damage. But it's, you know, I have insurance. It's replaceable. My family, it was more important. So I got them out of harm's way, it ended up not being as bad as it was, but you never know. You never, I've, I've yet to see a hurricane that really hits exactly where they're saying it's going to hit at the exact category yeah. or speed there's going to say it's it yeah so i mean it's this, mother nature no. and i'm um, look i'm not i'm not getting on the people that stayed there yeah you know um everyone has the reasons like my point being is understand your risk and when yep. oh absolutely once that breaks, once it hits a certain spot first responders are done they're not going to go out yeah. and it's not that they don't want to go out it's just that they can't get out yeah. without putting themselves at risk so and then you know here you know everyone you know start you know prepare prepare and have that plan and make sure uh you know you go over your plan now before it's too late so um yeah heart definitely goes out to everyone out there in the texas louisiana area get basically being affected pretty heavily and it's scary too um it's scary uh living through a natural disaster oh yeah always know you know and that wind sounds like a train coming through your house so uh what, what article do you have, Will? So uh, I don't know if you heard about the Iowa derecho, I think is how it's pronounced. It happened last week. So a derecho is a line of intense, widespread, and fast-moving windstorms and sometimes thunderstorms that move across a great distance and is characterized by damaging winds. So uh, it's like 
I don't want to say it's like a land hurricane, but it's similar. It, it, if you're going to compare it to it, it's like a giant tornado or hurricane over land, right? And so it, Iowa had one last week, and you're really not hearing a lot about it in the news because of all the other stuff that's going on between the riots and the the election season and all that stuff. But I think they said they're predicting at least $4 billion just in Ohio uh, worth of damage. And most of that's going to be to your livestock and your crops. And Iowa is the number one producer of soybeans, uh, corn, I think eggs and pork as well. So you could start seeing some higher prices and shortages of corn and soybeans and stuff like that in the in the supermarket here in a little while. I don't know if you've noticed uh, where you are, but I noticed gas went up about oh, yeah. 10, 20 cents uh, this yep. week just due to this hurricane coming because it's going to affect all know, the refineries. Our refineries down there. So yep. I filled up a few days ago and I was like, huh, it's up 20 cents. Nothing yep. as bad as California right now, but still it's <laughs> so whenever I think it's bad, I say go over to Europe and see how much it is a liter. So yeah. I mean, shoot, last time I was there is like five dollars, six dollars yep. a liter. Me too. Um, that's you know, they don't drive big SUVs like we do and big mm -hmm. trucks, but they also have diesel cars. So well that and you know, the size of their country is like a size of our state. So yeah. But if Toyota's listening, let's uh, let's bring a diesel truck here in the US, please. So, you know, the Hiluxes <laughs> that we've driven all around the world, let's try to get those here in the U.S. Uh, I'd be your number one buyer. So, <laughs> um, so my other uh, news article has to do with uh, the topic that just never seems to be going away, and that's COVID. Um, <sighs> so South Korea was still, I think, is considered the, the leader, kind of the forefront of fighting COVID, but they're having a huge outbreak right now. I don't know if you saw that, but they uh, reported mm -hmm. 441 new cases this morning um so which is their biggest daily increase since march where they had 483 so um and it's not just south korea so india has recorded uh they had their highest increase with seventy five thousand, almost seventy six thousand yep. uh new corona cases and they're you know equating that to you know ramping up testing um so um north korea has come out with saying that they've tested uh 2,767 people. So um, if you think we're doing a bad job, uh, go over to North Korea. And yeah. as far as, you know, less than 3,000 people have totally been tested in that country. But um, it just doesn't, you know, uh, Australia has a hot spot there in the Victoria state. So uh, it just doesn't seem to be going away. Just when we think like things are, are starting to normalize, there's a hot spot here. There's a hot spot yep. there. Um, and I think, uh, I think COVID's like riding a roller coaster, like that awful roller coaster that you absolutely despise, but you get pressured on to ride. Um, and you hate every single second of it. And there's parts of that roller coaster ride that are just absolutely horrible and miserable. That's what I feel like COVID is. It's like, all right, just when you're able to tolerate it a little bit, man, now you're going, you know, something else gets thrown at you. So, yeah. um, I guess just, you know, ride the wave. That's all you can do. And, uh, Try to have as much patience as you can. I know I was talking to my little sister this morning. Um, she called me at seven this morning, which is like four o'clock her time. Um, she's going to serve a warrant. And um, she was telling me about the schools there and, and the struggles they're having. I mean, here in North Carolina, I you know, the struggling with the online system. So I think it's uh, the new normal is just kind of learning how to how to embrace the suck right now. Yeah, you know, it, it makes you wonder how, what – any country is doing because South Korea was one of the most uh, strict countries when it came to mask wearing, social distancing, and lockdown. And now they're surging and stuff. And, and it just makes you wonder if there's really anything you can do other than, I mean, it seems like nothing we're doing is really working. You might flatten the curve a little bit, but as far as cases, you're really not, I, I don't, everybody, they're still rising. I don't see where it's really helping a lot. I mean, other than flattening so, the curve. I think, uh, you know, it's new. And I think that's what people need to realize that this is new, you know, it's, um, and it's going to take a while. It's going to take a while for either people to build up an immune system to it. Um, and for scientists to either get a vaccine or figure out, you know, the, the medications that will help you if you do get it. I had a buddy who, uh, one of my buddies in Baton Rouge a few weeks ago, um, he got it. He got it from his daughter. She just thought yeah. she had a cold. Uh, and for her, it was a cold. And for him, he said, you know, he wasn't on his deathbed, wasn't hospitalized, but it was miserable for two weeks. So, yep. um, uh, you know, be as patient as you can be. I think everyone, 
uh, everyone's patients are, are wearing a little thin. Um, and it's, well, you, well, you see small businesses collapsing and, and, you know, people are getting frustrated and you, they it made it political. So that's even more, people get more passionate and, and, and upset about things. I, I think that's why people are getting so sick and tired of it. A friend of mine, well, a friend of mine's son got it and he was sick for maybe three days and then he's back, back normal. You know, he did the quarantine 14 days and now he's back to work and he tested negative and positive than negative. So did he have it? I don't know. He was sick. He had a slight fever and some other issues, but you know, there's a lot of false positives. There's a lot of false negatives. I, it, like you said, we just don't know. And, and especially here in the States, it's so politicalized that it's just so frustrating that you don't really, I think you don't think really get, I don't think we're the only ones here where, I mean, yes, we're in a major election year. We are, you know, uh, we are the greatest country on the earth. Everyone does look to us. Everyone looks to the U.S. What is the U.S. doing? Um, whether we want to or not, or whether we agree on that statement that I just made or not. Um, so I, I think every country's going through it. We just realize, that, hey, you know, our little section of where we live, uh, what we see. So uh, my heart goes out, you know, New York restaurants. I'm a big restaurant guy. I have a bunch of buddies in the restaurant industry up there and um, decimated. You know, if they yeah. don't open up restaurants here, you know, for indoor dining, a lot of these famous well-off restaurants that are, that are icons in the city are going to go away. And then you're yeah. looking at how COVID has affected just tax revenue. You know, if people aren't able to go spend money uh, at these establishments, you know, New York City relies a lot on tourism. Yep. So, uh, yeah, as a, as a politician, I would hate to be a politician uh, right now in, in this climate. It, it doesn't matter – uh, what you do is right. There's always going to be something that's going to backfire come in your face. So yeah, um, it's it's just tough. So let's move on to something that uh, isn't so so draining and Debbie Downer. Entire, do you, do you have another article? I uh, just going to talk about how our the tit for tat over in China and the U.S. is still going on. Uh, we were doing some aerial maneuvers in uh, in a no fly zone. So China fired a couple of. Missiles. One they said is an aircraft carrier missile in the South China Sea to, in retribution, you know, retaliation or whatever. Yeah, you know, it's just there. It's just a lot of flexing going on back and forth, and you know we don't hear about that because obviously our news cycle is dominated by the politics for the uh, the presidential presidential election, and then the um, the COVID and and now all the riots, peaceful protests, whatever, and so. A lot of unless you go searching for this stuff, a lot of people don't realize what's going on over there. And it's been happening for years. Don't get me wrong. But I always like to see how how much it is. And it seems like it's ramped up a little bit over the last few months. Oh, absolutely. You know, I mean, China's military isn't what it was 20 years ago. They're a lot stronger. You know, they have, Mm -hmm. you know, their their sub bases, you know, some of these islands that you're seeing. You know, there's a report last week of a nuclear sub going in and out of a of an island, you know, yep. uh, a little tunnel that they've built. So, um, you know, China, they're that sleeping giant. Um, you just don't want to really mess with. Um, and I hope we have prevailing heads, you know. Um, it sounds like uh, Xi Jinping or however you say his name, the president of China and President Trump have a decent relationship. and um, They're both going to do what's best for their countries as they should. Um, and yep. hopefully uh, military leaders and all leaders across the board, you know, um, do what's best for your country, but also, you know, going to war for your country uh, with two major superpowers uh, isn't going to end well for anybody. No. Nope. So, so, um, all right. Yeah, this week, right? Uh, tell, let's talk about the subject and how you came about it, Will, and uh, then let's dive into that. All right. So, like I said in the opening, uh, I had a, I was talking to a, a listener and he asked me what the difference between a uh, threat and vulnerability was. I said, I was explaining to him. I said, Oh, you, you don't really know. He's like, well, no, you know, he's like, he's in law enforcement. He's like, you know, we, we have different, I guess, view or vernacular. So a threat to him is different than a little bit different in, in how he perceives a threat and a vulnerability as what you do in the security world. So I was talking to him about, it. I just thought, you know, Hey, that would be a good subject to talk about because we've never really covered the basics and, and what we're saying when we're talking about all this to people who are listening and might not understand, because I know I have a lot of family that listens to it and he's like, Oh yeah, it's good. I don't have no idea what you're talking about, but it's good. So I figured this might be a good one to kind of good time to just bring an overview of what we actually are talking about. So Jake, 
since you are the uh, guru of the two of us, <laughs> what is a security risk assessment? So what I look at a secure risk assessment or a security assessment, it's really just an evaluation. Um, it's performed to identify what the current security posture is of an organization uh, or facility. And then that assessment should identify, you know, first is what is the asset? What are you trying to protect? And there could be numerous assets that an organization or a family member wants to protect, you know, uh, you know, it could be intellectual property. It could be, uh, the facility itself, employees. So there's a whole gamut of uh, what an asset is. So that assessment really just reveals what those risks, threats, and vulnerabilities are to that asset um, and to that organization. Um, okay. So, so you're, it's, so you're a, it's a long report. Yeah. Oh, that definitely. Especially depending on, I mean, you, you know, I know our your company does a lot of the larger corporation stuff like that. So it's definitely going to be a lot more in depth than let's say something I did as a security assessment on a small business or a house. Um, yeah. I mean, let's take a school for example, right. You know um, most schools, you know, their assets are the children and, and the staff and the teachers, you know, yep. so that, you know, that is what they want to protect. Um, and so, you know, some might have computers, they may have, you know, band equipment, that this, that, and the other thing uh, that's also important to them, but their main asset. Uh, and that's what, yep. what I try to look at. Uh, and that conversation I have with all my clients is what are you trying to protect? What is your asset? And once they can identify that asset, then you can go into looking at what your risks, threats, and vulnerabilities are um, to the asset or assets that they're trying to protect. I, I think that's a very important point you made is identifying your asset. Because when you talk to somebody, you're like, hey, so what are you trying to pick? What's important to you? Someone say, well, everything, everything's important to me. This is my business. And you, you know, it's like, hey, is that table that important to you? Well, well, no, not the table. Of course not. Okay, so that's not really an asset. So it's it's good to identify what your primary asset is so you can actually do identify your threats, risk, and vulnerabilities. I mean, absolutely, Will. So you're a business owner, right? You own a bakery. Yeah. What is... What is your asset? And I'm putting you on the spot here, but what, what's your asset there uh, at your storefront, at your location? The number, the number one is going to be the employees, obviously, because okay? everything Why? else uh, can be replaced. Everything else can be replaced. Okay. And so that's how I look at it. You you can't replace a life. You can replace you can replace money isn't insured. You know the the yeah. the, the the items are insured. You can't you can't replace somebody's life. And, that's, and then I'm sure you have some certain recipes, right, that you want to protect. Um, yeah, that could be. Yeah proprietary to, to your location and then your yep. equipment, right? And your storefront. And so your number one asset, like you said, are your employees. And then after that, you kind of break it down, you know, kind of put it on a scale. And it's not as easy as we're making a sound right now, because there's some things you, you got to quantify and give a number to. Uh, yep. And that's, you know, that's the hard part for that business owner, for that CEO and, and the management team, you know, the C-suite to, to sit there and, and literally <laughs> identify Okay, we know what number one and number two are. That's easy. But what's number three, four, five, and six? What does that look like? And for me, it's easy because I'm a small, you know, small business. You know, it's obviously to me, I put more stake in a person than I do anything else. But when you start talking about some of these corporations, you think of like KFC with their 16 ingredients or whatever, or Coke with their secret ingredient. I'm not, you know, I don't know how they predict, how they quantify or their asset protection but i imagine that their recipe is pretty high up there as opposed to a smaller business that you know say yeah my recipes are important but it's not worth a life to me you know i'm not making billions of dollars because of my recipe yeah i mean so one of my clients big chemical plastics company right 86 locations around the globe how do you pick which location is the most important yep you know and and so again that's not as as my job as a security professional um, that's the one thing I do ask my clients is, Hey, I, I need to know what's the most important. How do we rank them? Um, and their facilities and their sites are definitely important. That's how they make their money. That's how, you know, they're a fortune 500 type company is, is, is off their production. So, uh, but I would say that every single customer I've ever had their number one asset, usually, um, when it comes to companies are their employees. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, um, if you're an employee out there and you don't think you're important, uh, rest assured, every CEO that I've ever talked to, uh, a business owner, has always said his employees are uh, their, their number one goal uh, in protecting. And then yeah. after that, it's usually the facilities or their intellectual property, and, and then you go down the list. So, um, 
So we, we talked about asset, asset, asset a lot. So, um, Will, you know, in your mind, what is an asset? An asset is the person, place, or thing that you're trying to protect, right? It's it's what you're trying to protect. What What is an asset to you that you need to protect in order to keep your business going or, or, or survive. Right. So, yeah. And, and, you know, as on a personal level, like a business, those assets are pretty defined, right? Um, it's, it's how you're generating revenue. Um, and those vehicles, whether it's a person, it's a machine, uh, it's a location, whatever that, that asset is, it, it's a thing. Um, yep. and it's usually tangible. Um, exactly. so helping someone determine an asset, I, I always try to ask them like, okay, let's take a, Take your home, for example, and take your family out of it. You know, what is what is the one thing? And I've had people tell me, hey, and I've done homes for ultra high wealth individuals, but you're looking at, you know, either some multi million dollar piece of art, jewelry, that kind of stuff, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, for us common people, you know, back when I had a Harley, um, you know, I would say that my Harley, that was like the one thing, like, hey, yes, it can be replaced. I just, mm-hmm. you know, it's been modified, yeah. it's mine, yeah. it's what I want, you know. Um, that would be, I, I would say, you know, that was my one big thing, you know, now in my house, besides like the photo albums and the hard drives and that kind of stuff, I'd say my gun's safe, right? Because that keeps yep. everything in there. If something were to happen, it's like, all right, man, I'm em- going run into the gun safe. I'm emptying everything out as fast as I can and go, you know, we still have film and uh, pictures and that stuff from weddings mm-hmm. and the kids and, and the hard drives, um, but I'm taking everything I can out of that, out of that safe. So in, in your house, Will, what, what's the one thing that like, minus your family, Right. And people, what's, what's the asset yeah. that you, and I'm trying to do this. So people as they're listening, they think like, okay, Hey, if you can relate to it on a personal level, it's easier to, to do it on a business level. Yep. So like, I know when I, when we were evacuating for the hurricane, I had to explain to my daughter, I was like, don't, she's like, I was like, pack stuff that's important to you and let's go. And she started packing. So I was like, don't pack your toys. We can replace that pack stuff that you can't replace. So like for me, it was the stuff that my kids had made, you know, like little art stuff. It's not worth anything, but to me it's important. Right. So I was packing that stuff. Uh, my, I have a family heirloom that's been passed down through the generations that is to me, it's irreplaceable. So, you know, I packed that stuff and took that with me. TVs, um, you know, computer stuff like that. It's, it's, yeah, I, if I could take it, I would, but when it comes down to it, that's yeah. not my top priority. I'm getting my family and my most important yeah. stuff that I can't replace is how I look at it. Yeah. I always say like, Hey, if you have one minute to grab what you need to grab your most important thing, what would it be? You know? And some yep. will say like, boom, you know, it would be like, okay, yep. I'm going to grab my Harley or now it'll be my gun sleeve, you know? And then to, to help them out, okay, now if you have 15 minutes, what would you grab? If you have 30 minutes, what would you grab if you have an hour? And that helps them kind of, you know, in their mind, okay, prioritize. Prioritize, yep. So uh, I All think right. we beat up asset pretty good. I hope yep. our listeners kind of get a good feel for, you know, what is an asset. Um, and it could be a little drawing that your kid did when they were two years old or a little note that they made in seventh grade when they're sitting in detention uh, <laughs> to their mom. And, you know, the mom's treasured that note. So – uh, it doesn't have to be monetary value. It could be sentimental value as well. So, yep. um, and that's for, you know, each individual to decide what is that asset. Yep. So uh, that's good. So now it's, it, here's the all important one, right? So what is a risk? Oh, here we go. So a risk is just a situation that exposes danger and it involves danger, right? So um, let's talk airborne operations, right? A risk is you're going to you're going to perform something or something's going to happen and it, it's a byproduct. And so uh, one of the risks of I mean, there's hundreds of risks when you're doing an airborne operation, Air operation out of an yeah. airplane. Um, if you're doing static line, you could have a static line entanglement and you could get drugged by the airplane, and get slapped around uh, until you're released. Um, you could have a bad landing where you break an ankle, leg, femur, back. Uh, concussion. You know, so those are all risks to that. Parachute that issues. Thing. There's so, so many to list. Yeah. yeah. And so I, when we're talking organizations, right? So that, you know, uh, that risk that I just mentioned about airborne operations, I'm hoping our listeners can kind of visualize that. You know, those are risks that every paratrooper, skydiver, anyone who jumps out of an airplane, those are those inherent risks that they're taking uh, yeah. in doing that. So when it comes to organizations and when it comes to risk for an organizations, uh, what we're looking at is the potential harms to either their systems and their overall business. So several examples, just real quick examples of physical security risks uh, that I like to look at and talk about um, that a lot of people just 
don't think of and you hear about a lot. One is tailgating, right? Um, you know, when you have a an access control system and it's there in place and it's there for a reason, right? It's to prevent unauthorized personnel into your building in an into your building. And, uh, and by tailgating, you mean somebody like going in with the same person as they enter in. Correct. Correct. Their car. Yeah. Not tailgating like the way I drive on the freeway. Yeah. I'm not talking about, you know, <laughs> or that, partying that out there in front of the football yeah. game. So. Yeah. So that, I mean, both of those have a risk, right? So my driving at 90 miles an hour, 10 feet behind someone, that's a huge risk. Uh, this risk I'm talking about is physical security is yep. entry way, uh, tailgating, you know, uh, controlled access. So, um, you know, what that's doing is you're, you're allowing that risk. You're opening up that risk, that potential of, hey, it's just the UPS man. Mm-hmm. Well, is it just the UPS man? Is the UPS man working for your competitor? Is he looking to either drop off a listening device, whatever, or is he looking to gain information on you? Um, or or so, is it a employee that got fired that you don't know about that wants to come back and do some workplace violence? And yeah. he goes in with Joe Bob that he's best friends with and has no idea or, or you know. So. Yep. So, so those examples of like tailgating, you know, you're, you want to account for your visitors. Do you have a visitor log? Uh, you're looking at theft, theft of documents, theft of sensitive information, proprietary information, cyber attacks, right? Um, and so uh, when we're looking at security as for an organization, those are, you know, I just spout off probably four or five, but there's hundreds of them depending on what that organization yep. is. So those are different, uh, different risks. So in those, I would say most organizations that I deal with, um, they go to great lengths uh, to mitigate, to transfer and accept those risks. And a great thing to do for every organization, just like you're doing a security assessment, do a risk assessment. Um, I I honestly think part of that threat assessment should include a risk assessment. Yeah, Um, absolutely. And that's usually like the first line of defense, because once you can identify what those risks are, then you can create a plan. And so um, it's better to prepare for those. You're doing... You're doing that what if game, but those assessments are necessary uh, for that baseline of attack, yep. right? To, to look at them, to identify them, and how to how to have a defense or an offense against them. So, uh, go I ahead. think when you're talking about risk, you know, most people don't realize, but you do a risk assessment every time you leave your house, every time you get in your car and you drive to work. You're you're doing a risk. All right, is it is it is it worth me driving here? in a car where I can potentially get an accident somebody or, you know, blow a tire, run off the road. All those are considered risks, right? When you're going to your job and most people accept the risk by getting in the car, driving to their job and going to work. And if you, I think if you make, if you kind of interpret it to normal, what people do every day, it's a little under, easier to understand. Totally. I mean, so let's take COVID, right? We've been talking about COVID since March. Um, you know, do you wear a mask? Do you not wear a mask? Do you wear gloves? Do you not wear a glove? Do you travel? Do you not travel? Right. And so the CDC, the World Health Organization, all these different organizations, your your local community uh, health leaders, they're all providing guidance, you know, based on their assumptions and some of the facts that they know about, about COVID. Um, if you choose not to wear a mask, if you choose not to wear gloves, if you choose to go out, you know, if you make these choices, you're in your mind, you're not doing it on paper, but you're probably, you, you're doing a risk assessment. Well, hey, you know, I, I've looked at the numbers and it's less than 1% death mortality rate. I, I think I'm, you know, uh, Jake, the way I drive, it's like, hey, I have a higher chance of probably dying in a car wreck <laughs> than I do with COVID just because I'm a prick on the road and I want to get there and I want to go fast, blah, blah, blah. So I, you know, I don't systematically do a risk assessment in my head, but I did when I first started going out. With COVID, yeah. I looked at the numbers. I looked at what was going on. Like, okay, hey, if I do this and I put myself at risk and I put my family at risk, yes, I am. At what level of risk? Still to be determined. Um, yeah. And so, so part of that risk assessment and that risk, um, I call it a risk management program. I think every organization have a risk management program, and that's to help them better understand and not just understand what that risk is, but to measure it. And so, if we take COVID for example, like we we're just talking about, it's a good way to understand what the problem is. And how are you going to mitigate it? Um, And I think business leaders and security leaders, for that matter, are always trying to solve what that true risk is. And how do you calculate um, for when it can be mitigated or how can you do it so it's avoided? Um, So there's always risk in everything we do in life. There's risk in business. Um, If you're a successful business, you're you're going to have people that are going to try and penetrate you. So how do you mitigate that risk? 
All good points. Great. Uh, so let's talk about threats. And man, I feel like I don't. I drink like a whole <laughs> cup of coffee right now. I'm super amped about this. I don't know. <laughs> you're, you're getting excited. I know. But I love it, man. Uh, <laughs> All right. So what is a threat then? So a threat is either a person or the thing that's going to cause damage or danger, or it's going to exploit that vulnerability. So the threat's going to be the one that actually is attacking your risk or going is the responsible for the risk, right? Or, yep. yep. So COVID, that is the threat. A crappy driver on the road, your Jake's out there. I am the, the threat, <laughs> right? Uh, you're trying to avoid, you're, you're trying to get away or push away or protect against that threat. So, uh, so if you think of what is a threat, think of COVID, that's your threat. And so, again, I'd say most organizations, they want to take, they, they do, they take actions against those credible threats that are out there and they try to stop it before it happens. Sometimes they just don't know. Uh, you look okay. at a lot of cyber attacks, right? They don't always um, if their systems aren't performing well, they weren't up to date, or that nation state actor has more advanced technology, they may not always know if it's like a DDoS type attack mm -hmm. uh, uh, where it's slowly occurring and then it hits all at once. So, um, you know, natural threats, you know, let's we just talked about a hurricane. That is a natural threat, you know, floods, fires, tornadoes, earthquakes. Um, those are those are threats. So the threat actors um are really just they're trying to sabotage, they're trying to disrupt sabotage operations. Um, which then leads to the fear, right, of organizations mm -hmm. of how am I going to defend against it? So, again, COVID, a great example of that threat. You know, there's fear. There's that unknown. And organizations, not just medical, not just the CDC, but every organization that I, I deal with, you know, they have a COVID response, you know. Yep. Um, and how do they how do they treat that threat that, you know, if you're in a manufacturing uh, industry and I didn't think about this till you know COVID hit, but you know a virus like this that spreads rapidly, very contagious, it goes into your plant. Good luck, you know that plant shut down for weeks if not months. Oh yeah, you know and if you're a multi billion dollar company, we're talking millions of dollars lost every single day. We kind of heard about it a little bit, so you know the toilet paper was one thing, but then you started hearing about the meat. You know, the scarcity of the meat because some of these plants were getting infected with COVID. So, uh, COVID, think of COVID as your threat. So, so yeah, so essentially the risk is getting sick. The threat is COVID. So, what's the vulnerability then? The vulnerability is, is kind of like that state of being exposed to that possibility of being attacked or harmed. So if you look at a physical location, right? Um, vulnerability really exposes those those potential weak points. We've talked about access control. You know, your entry exit, that is a vulnerability if you're in a secure site. Let's just, even a school, we've talked about schools, right? So keeping people who you don't want coming onto that property. Uh, and I'm just using property as a vulnerability mm -hmm. right now in that access control. Um, but usually, like at a site, um, you know, whether it's a manufacturer, school, wherever it is, the vulnerability usually can be softened and remedied by hardening up and preventing exploitation of those weaknesses. So vulnerability is is just it's a weakness. Okay. Uh, so so I risk is. Good. I'm sorry. So risk is COVID. The threat or risk is getting sick. The threat is COVID. The vulnerability is not having the proper. Uh, Let's say Enforce, enforcement of your you're not having the proper enforcement of your mask policy. So people aren't wearing their mask correctly. And so that's a vulnerability. Yeah. Or if you have it, or if you have diabetes or an underlying health condition. Right. OK. That's something inherent that you already have. And how are you going to protect against it? Okay. And so how do all these work together? Uh, so what you're doing when you're doing a, a security, a physical security assessment or even a cybersecurity assessment uh, they really kind of go hand in hand, but you're, you're assessing, you're measuring your risk, you're measuring your threats and your, your vulnerabilities against that asset. And when you're taking this huge pile of risk, threats, and vulnerabilities, you're dissecting them down into what the asset or assets are. And then you're coming up with a game plan on how to protect them. And it's usually, you know, there's, if you look at one of my reports, right, you're, you're looking at, you know, 20, 30 pages of, you know, what I like to identify 
uh, you know, identify what the problem is, have a discussion about it, and then provide a suggestion or a recommendation for it. And so mm-hmm. I would say that's a majority of of the security assessments that I do. Uh, and I'd say most security professionals do the same thing. You know, you're identifying um, what these are and then breaking them down, having a discussion as to why it's important, and then providing a recommendation for them. So uh, to answer your question, it, it all ties into those risks and uh, security assessments um, to protect that asset and how to protect against it. And essentially by doing all this together, you're kind of talking about protection in depth to, to for, you know, for lack of a better word, you right? Yeah. So, you know, um, we talk about access control, right? So access control can, let's take um, a major office building downtown somewhere and that they have a, a parking garage next door to them. And they could even have their own separate road uh, getting to that office building uh, entrance way, right? So, that protection in depth almost starts on the outside there of, you know, you have to have access control to get into the parking garage. Once you're in the parking garage, you park your car and you walk to the building, you have to, you know, swipe, you know, your card reader, whatever it is, your token to get inside the actual office building. Another layer of keeping people out. Then once you get to the elevators, you have to swipe or the stairwell, you got to swipe your card again to access whatever floor you have access to. If yep. you're in the executive suite, usually those are on the higher floors um, and those have restricted access. So um, that's kind of talking, you know, one little example of access control using protection in depth, but you're trying to push it out as far as way as possible. Yep. Um, you look at fires, right? Gr- growing up in California, I think you grew up in Montana, right? Wildfires. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, I know the California Department of Forestry, I always told people, you know, with, cabins and, and homes in the mountains to, to mow clear, you know, a good portion of yep. debris and everything away uh, from their, from their house. And that just gives them an added layer of protection. So that's really what you're trying to do. When you talk protection and depth, you're just trying to push it out as far away as possible, but you can't do that unless you know your risk threats and vulnerabilities and what your and asset, is. asset is. Yep, exactly. So essentially you're trying to, it's almost like an onion. You want to put as many layers between the asset and the outside So they have to peel back layer after layer after layer to get to it. And one of those layers or multiple layers should prevent them from getting to it. Yeah. And so it's just, so it's not just about having layers, but it's also checking those layers, making sure those layers are functioning in a proper manner. Um, You know, it's, it's one thing to have a fence, but if someone can cut a hole in the fence and no one's checking that fence, the fence really isn't doing any good. Right. Uh, That, that mal actor can come in and, and do what they need to do just because of, you have a fence. So you got to constantly check this thing, you know, uh, whatever defense mechanism you're using definitely needs to be checked, you know, daily. Um, Cause you just never know when that threat actor is going to act. You know, one thing that, um, you know, fighting the war on terrorism and, and you hear a lot um, and working with the different federal law enforcement agencies here in the U S and, and talking to them is, you know, the bad guys only have to get it right once. Yep. You know, for them, for the, your security professionals and your law enforcement professionals, they have to bat a thousand every single day, you know, and, you know, 9-11 was a breakdown. Um, if you read the 9-11 commission report, huge book, I read it before I joined the military, but it really talked about the breakdown between the different law enforcement communities on the local level, all the way up to the federal level of information um, not being shared, not getting passed along and all the different roadblocks. I would like to say it's gotten better since the commission and, Everything's gone out, but I can tell you there's still impasses between, you know, the different three letter agencies and the military and everyone else, you know, you know, um, so uh, my point being with that is as a security professional, you know, you, uh, you want to get it right the first time. There isn't a lot of room um, to fail. However, let's be realistic, right? We're not perfect uh, all the time. So um, part of, you know, security plan should always be your second, third, you know, what is your backup? So when something bad does happen, you should definitely have a plan A and a plan B to back it's everything your response up. response plan, get, yep. Uh, to get everything going. Yes, you said exactly right, Will. The, the response, response plan. Yep. So I think we've kind of talked a lot about risk, threats, vulnerabilities, assets, stuff like that. And I know we talked about this a little bit before, but what is uh, crime prevention through environmental design? So SEPTED, right? I mean, that's an acronym we throw out. Uh, I'm horrible I try to be really good about not throwing acronyms out. So I'm glad you you spelled it out for everyone. So uh, CPTED, Crime Prevention Through Environmental Design. 
It's really just an approach uh, that some security experts use to reduce crime uh, using urban and environmental design, and not just urban environmental design. You're also you can use terrain and other stuff depending on what location yeah. you're at. So, um, things that come to mind, right, is uh, what kind of lighting you're using, what kind of fencing you're using, types of different barriers, even landscaping and the terrain. You know, if you're building a new uh, complex somewhere, uh, you know what terrain, what terrain's around you, whether it's natural terrain or man-made terrain. You know, yep. if you're going to build a high-rise building, um, you know, let's say in New York City, is it going to be, I don't know, 200 floors, you know, or is it going to be 30 floors? And then what's that look like? You know, um, what threats are you looking at with those different floor levels of whether you're way up high or down low? Uh, lighting, you know, or is lighting going out? Is it, is the lighting you're using, is it blocking or skewing your your video cameras, your recording system, you know, lighting is great. Uh, and it's a deterrent, uh, it helps you identify stuff, but if it's blocking your video camera that's sitting there to record, what good is it doing? You know, you've almost, so, uh, looking at those things, fencing, you know, are you using chain link fence? Are you using barbed wire fence? Are you using wrought iron fence? Are you, you know, what kind of fencing are you using? Can you see through it? Can you not see through it? And what are the pros and cons of each one? And so, um, landscaping the same thing. Are you using trees and bushes to block your view or are you using it intermittently so you can kind of see through um, and see what's on the outside? So uh, for each circumstance, you know, there isn't a set answer for any of this for, no, for no. how you use crime prevention through environmental, environmental design. It, it's location specific and asset specific. So, um, but that is a term that we use quite a bit, Will, and I'm glad you kind of brought that up. So uh, it has to do with the environment around um, that asset that you're trying to protect. Right. I think that was a nice like, little explanation for it. So now we get to talk about your favorite subjects in the world. How does due diligence tie into all of this? So I, I, I think that's pretty simple uh, for me is <laughs> doing your due diligence, right? So understanding what your asset is, doing your homework on what your asset is. If you already know it, okay, um, that's great. So now you got to do your homework on what are your threats and your risks and your vulnerabilities. So doing your research. Uh, into knowing what those threats, risk, and vulnerabilities are to your asset. Um, and so then you're going to do your homework and your due diligence um, on how you're going to come up with that risk management plan, you know, how you're going to use SEPTED, uh, crime prevention through environmental design. So due diligence starts at the very beginning. I would say if you're a security professional and you have what you would consider a potential client, your due diligence to start right there, research who your client is, what they do and how they do it, who they're involved with. Second is once you've done that and you sign the contract and you've had that discussion on what the asset is, do your homework on what the threats are, what the risks are and what the vulnerabilities are. Um, Cause each client's a little different, each location is different. And then there's different tools for that. So um, that's how I would say you, you do your due diligence in there is research everything from start to finish um, in that assessment. <laughs> Definitely a good podcast today. I think uh, we covered quite a bit of uh, the basics. Um, obviously, we can have a conversation on probably each subject that we had today, but I think this is a good kind of overview of everything that we talk about in the past and kind of give us a good foundation going forward. Um, so I've got some exciting news. We have launched the YouTube channel. No, no, no. Oh. Uh, not this week. Okay. But we have launched, that would be a 2020 thing though. So we have launched the YouTube channel. So now you get to check out our lovely faces, which by the way, we're both of our faces were made for radio. Uh, you can go to youtube.com, <clears throat> excuse me, and search security matters with the coffee squad. And uh, just go there, please uh, comment and let us know what we're doing, what you like, stuff like that. And make sure you subscribe. It is very important that you guys subscribe. We really appreciate it. And, that way you can see our lovely faces and hear our lovely voices on our weekly episodes. And as always, you can also listen to and subscribe to us at www.coffeesquadpodcast.com or search the security matters with the coffee squad on your local, I mean, on your favorite podcast platform. Also give us a like and follow on Facebook at coffee squad podcast. Just search it on Facebook and you can find us there and no more news. We are also on Instagram. So if you go to security underscore matters, underscore podcast, uh, you can leave a comment. We do, you know, get kind of just another platform to let you guys know what's going on. 
Awesome. Well, thanks for uh, updating everyone and uh, working uh, hard on this. So, um, you know, we've slowly grown this uh, podcast. Uh, we're on episode 26. Um, and so we'll, again, shout out to you, man. Great job uh, on doing all this. And again, appreciate all our listeners and all our followers out there. Um, thank you to our listeners who kind of asked, you know, what the difference is between a risk and a threat and a vulnerability. So, um, wasn't much of a discussion today, more of uh, thoughts. But um, again, please share share with us what you'd like us to talk about. Um, and if you'd like to be a guest on the show, um, reach out to us. So we've had uh, we've had a few of them already. So uh, hope everyone has a great week. Hope those who are being affected by the hurricane, um, yeah, can manage through it um, and get the help that they need if they need help. So thank you guys. Have a great week. All right. Thanks.